All right, good morning, everybody. Welcome. My name is Elizabeth Bernhard, and I have the pleasure of serving as the Executive Director of the Manufacturing Growth Alliance, or MGA. MGA is a statewide trade association exclusively focused on the unique needs of Michigan's small to mid-sized manufacturers. And so we are excited to bring you education and services that are unique for your, your needs as a small to medium-sized manufacturer. So a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, this conversation is being recorded so that we can share it out with our networks and so that you can have access to watch it later and to share with your colleagues. We will also be sending out the slides from today's conversation, so you will have access to it after the event. During the, our conversation, we ask you to include your questions, add your questions to the chat, but we will be holding your questions until the Q&A session at the end of the conversation. We are scheduled to go until 945, and so we'll move to Q&A at about 930, 935. At that time, I will uh, change your status so that you can unmute yourself if you would like, so you can personally ask questions of Mike, our presenter. So that with that housekeeping in mind, it is my pleasure to be able to introduce you to Mike Corey, founder and CEO of Blue Sales Fly. Mike has over 25 years of experience in sales, and he founded Blue Sales Fly to help CEOs and sales leaders improve their sales performance. He believes that the sales profession is due for an upgrade. The buyer-seller relationship is tangled into a knot and it is not working. And he believes it's time to elevate the sales profession. At MGA, we are very excited to introduce you to his game-changing approach, which is essentially a systems approach to the sales function. And when he's not coaching or speaking or leading webinars with MGA, you can find Mike spending time with his family, reading, writing, or standing in a river with a fly rod. Mike, welcome. Thank you and happy to be here. And thanks to uh, to everybody for joining. And, uh, and I appreciate MGA uh, taking this step to help bring new education and new insights to, to the manufacturing population in Michigan. I'm I am a proponent of that having grown up in the Flint area and I am I'm I'm rooting for the resurgence of manufacturing in the state of Michigan. So today let's talk about uh, sales knots and untangling those knots that are they're causing growth and I think first what I'd like to do is give you a little bit of background of how I came up with the concept of sales knot and and actually it's it's due to my son and son-in-law who would tease me because whenever we were fly fishing, I tended to uh, do a better job of catching the oaks and maples and, and the logs. And uh, I was frequently trying to get my fly out of the tree or out of the log while my son and son-in-law are reeling in uh, all kinds of trout or smallmouth. And it dawned on me that, uh, and because I like a play on words, whenever I was knotted up in the trees, I was not fishing. And I realized that a lot of that is what happens in business. So I came up with a word because we get to do that these days and uh, came up with the concept of a sales knot. And, and basically it's something that you're doing or not doing that is causing a constriction in your business. And, and there are a lot of them, but today we're going to talk about three big ones, the three biggest ones that I see as most prevalent uh, in, in the market right now. And the knot problem is, is pervasive. So throughout my career, whether it was selling uh, five cent medical devices or $5 million outsourced uh, service contracts, all of these companies would have the similar problems. Um, and is most prevalent in complex sales where there's multiple buyers. And sometimes, especially in manufacturing where there's RFPs, this is where the knots can become very pervasive. And they strangle not only growth, but definitely they strangle margin. So today's goal, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to identify, untangle, and navigate. So I'll help you identify what the knots look like. We'll uh, show you how to untangle them and how to navigate forward so that you don't run into these in the future. I want to start with a little bit of market background. So there's there's two big competing ideas in the market right now on the one side on the left side of the screen is the current customer's negative view of sales. All of the uh, buyer surveys are 
not positive. If we were looking at it from a quality standpoint or a quality manufacturing standpoint, we would have a huge problem because our customers don't want to talk to the salespeople. Uh, almost 70% of the deals that are started by salespeople fizzle out to, to no decision. And our clients are starting with the process and starting with the buying process and investigation uh, going 56 to 80% into their decision before they are bringing salespeople along. So that that's a big problem. On the other side, if we think about our customers, uh, the other problem is that 85% of the time, according to the CEOs, they don't do a very good job of identifying the root cause of the problem that they're trying to solve. And that same survey, 87% of those CEOs said that that came with dire financial consequences. And there's another new book out that came that showed that uh, large single uh, projects, anything, and they defined a single project as anything from a kitchen renovation to building a nuclear power reactor. 91.5% of those go either over budget, over time, or miss the scope. And there's a large percentage of almost in the 70% that actually strike out on all three of those. So two big market factor problems. They The clients don't really want to work with salespeople, and yet salespeople are the ones, good salespeople are the ones that could actually help them navigate this better. So with that as a backdrop, and then thinking about what customers really want, they really want buyer centricity. They really want us to come back to that point where we can help co-create the value, where we take into account their world and we take into account the things that they are trying to, to deal with and, and solve, <clears throat> excuse me, and not come at them with the, the traditional approach of trying to use leverage. So with that as a backdrop, we'll jump right into the number one sales knot. And, and the biggest problem I see right now is that salespeople are, are arriving late in the process. So if we think about the buyer's journey, and I'm a big fan of the hero's journey. If you think of uh, any of the big epic tales, the Lord of the Rings or Star Wars, there, there's always a, a hero, Luke Skywalker. Uh, and, and then there's also, you know, Yoda and, and actually any number of other mentors or guides that help the hero get to their destination. Well, the buyer's journey, our buyer is the hero and the buyer's journey is what process they go through in trying to solve the problem. They may not at first be aware that there's an issue and then something comes up and they have this level of awareness and then they, they decide they need to start investigating how they might solve this. And then after they do that, they might prepare a budget and then, then they decide to start reaching out. And ever since the internet came along and ever, ever since we started repelling some of the buyers with bad sales behaviors, they started going further and further along. So the real problem right now is that when your salespeople are arriving, the buyer is already 56 to 80% through their cycle. They've gone through all of these journeys, most of them in internal, but they've talked to other companies, they've talked to friends, they've perhaps talked to existing vendors, and they're a long way along before they really start inviting all of the salespeople in to, to look at the problem to help them. And by now, they've also framed the problem in their own way. And if we go back to that stat of not identifying the right root cause, they could very well have some, some bad assumptions or assumptions that are not going to be safe for them. So when your team arrives late, that means already they're playing from behind because there's so much work that has already been done by the, by the client. And they've missed all of that leading time to add value and to help shape the journey and most importantly, to build trust. So when, when we come in late, that's when everybody starts seeing those types of behaviors that they don't like from salespeople where they're trying to, they're trying to play catch up. They're trying to find a way to get a toehold. Uh, there was a book done years ago that I was a big fan of. It was called The Challenger Sale. And it was all about teaching, tailoring, and taking control of the sales process. And it was uh, about using insights that the clients you know, may not have known about. It was a great approach. The problem is nobody taught salespeople how to be empathetic and disrupt a process. So they didn't take the time 
to uncover real insights that added value to the buyer. So some of those behaviors are what everybody takes to the to the deal now, and they end up disrupting, but not really adding value. The other big thing uh, to think about as a company leader and as a CEO is that your best time for your margin is way back at the beginning, because the farther the deal goes along, the more the competitors come up, the more you're now fighting in that mix where all of the three lines cross. And that's where most salespeople are arriving today. And that late arrival, it helps it helps to distance the relationship and it helps to cause your margin to decline. And that's what's causing the current biggest not problem in the sales today. So how do we untangle this? And when should your sales team arrive? To get the best success for you and for your client, we really need to be thinking way ahead of when the client is buying and how you start communicating and how you start communicating value and how you start communicating their problems is is the way that you change the game with this. And so we do that by first understanding what their goals are. And this takes that whole traditional, you know, product-centered approach and flips it around so that we're looking at it from the buyer's point of view. What are the goals that they have for their organization? What do you know and your team know about their business and how your segment of that business affects their overall market share, growth plans, uh, safety? There's things that you know about your client's business and surrounding your product of their business that would be of extreme value to them if it's packaged in a more buyer-centric way. What do they want? What are the buyer needs that they are looking at for their upcoming year or for their market growth challenges or for the problems and obstacles that they're trying to overcome? And ultimately, what are their priorities? The sales people should be equipped with these ideas and insights, and I call them maps, to help the client understand where those obstacles are to their growth and to give them real insights. Uh, I had a, a, a fellow friend that uh, has a flowery way with words, and he said the problem with most insights is they're like a three-week-old uh, all-you-can-eat buffet. Uh, none of them are really all that insightful or uh, intriguing, and they're actually probably going to hurt you <laughs> if if you ingest them. But you, inside your business, inside your your marketing, inside your research, inside your knowledge about the products and solutions you have, there are valuable, knowledgeable nuggets that you could help your client to overcome these obstacles and and see better into the future. And so the number one way we untangle, not number one, is have your team in early and arrive with ideas, insights, strategies that are aligned to helping the client find their goal, to help uncover the problems that they might not be seeing and use that opportunity to then help them navigate to the right destination. Identify those threats that they may not be thinking about and to be proactive in their growth. I think one of the words have important meanings. And I think we've traditionally looked at uh, accounts as an account management. Well, no one likes to be managed. You know, we really should be looking at our clients as account growth or or customer success or how we help take them to, to a new level. So that's untangling not number one. Not number two brings into one of my favorite quality thinkers. And I'm sure uh, as all excellent manufacturers, you're familiar with Edwards Deming. But if I love his saying that if you can't describe what you're doing as a process, you don't know what you're doing. One of the biggest problems I see, not number two, is a lack of a customized sales process. And I know it's as boring as, you know, toast unbuttered. But when you think about the value of what a sales process does, is it provides, it goes from chaos to order, not only for your sales team, but for your client. Because the real value in developing a sales process is helping the client navigate those obstacles. So, so if we go back to that buyer journey concept, and we go back to the fact that most of the time, 
most of the time, according to all the surveys out there, they have the wrong root cause and they have the wrong destination. And uh, <laughs> not sure how I do that. <laughs> it's a new thing with Zoom. Balloons for free. Uh, we really should use the sales process as an opportunity to help them navigate their buying decision better and to help your sales team take them on the process that leads the most success for you. So how do we start to do that? Well, we first have to understand that there's two sides to this problem. The biggest problem from the internal side is that these are not usually customized. They're not in your CRM. <clears throat> Excuse me, not everybody is following them. And most sales processes aren't designed to help the sales team sell better. The value, the strategic value, the playbooks or sales maps are not included in there. And then more than likely, I often see that unfortunately, sales managers are not coaching to that because it hasn't been internalized as the best practice. On the client side, that means we're showing up where we're not adding insight, uh, we're not in early, we're not portraying the culture and the value mission of our organization in a way that would draw the clients in and make them want to engage. And we're not using a strategic approach for either them or ourselves. So there's there's two big problems in, in what's facing the knot for, for the sales process. So how do we untangle that number two? Well, take all of that value concept from number one, take the biggest obstacles and problem detection and um, mission navigational type stuff that can help the client get to a better way and start to put that into your sales process. Customize it to use your unique culture, your unique strategic value, and make sure that that gets uh, inculcated into the process so that it is unique to you, unique to your team, helps demonstrate your value, and then put it in your CRM and customize it. A big problem is that a lot of CRMs are just used with the off-the-shelf process that comes in, and none of the value, none of your culture, none of the things that makes you unique and, and intriguing to your clients is built in there. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, when that is in there, then now your sales team can coach and train from that daily because it really should be the the CRM should be something that they want to be in. It shouldn't be something that your sales leadership has to, you know, berate them monthly to make sure you update it because it's going to be uh, putting the pipeline in front of the C-suite. So that's not number two. Not number three, <clears throat> excuse me, is the technology. This is an area that is going to rapidly, rapidly either unravel or, or tighten up quickly. And uh, recently, two of the biggest, um, Google and Yahoo, have just recently clamped down on, <laughs> balloons again, have recently clamped down on how many emails can be sent out. One of the big problems with uh, the buyer-seller relationship occurred when we were in the pandemic. In fact, the pandemic accelerated a lot of these problems. But when we were all locked in our homes and couldn't go anywhere, uh, a lot of the companies knew that we were sitting ducks basically and they fired up the spam can and then they just unloaded on us and that's why your inboxes have blown up over the last few years well google and yahoo are taking on that problem and they're going to be clamping down so some of the biggest technology you know emailers outreach and sales loft and some of the other big sequencing companies are announcing dramatic changes so from a consumer standpoint that's better because here's what's happened to the sales marketing technology world. This is a slide that's done by a company called Vendor Neutral. And every single one of these little squares is some sort of sales or marketing technology. When you look at this on their website, they have a little magnifying glass on your cursor so you can actually read this. This market segment has absolutely exploded. Like there is enormous amounts of technology out there. But the real problem is, is that despite all of this boom, the sales performance has declined or at best stayed the same. So there's an enormous amount of pressure and an enormous amount of uh, of tools out there. But it's kind of like the Goldilocks. Goldi you know, most companies either have way too little or they have way too much. And, and there's not a lot of 
alignment or balance between them. So how do we untangle this one? Well, using the value of not number one and not number two, start with your CRM. And if it is not able to be customized, get rid of it. Even companies, uh, there was a study out that companies that were frustrated with Salesforce and decided to leave Salesforce, their payback was usually uh, under a year. Uh, it was a very, it's a much faster payback than um, than people are worried about, especially when you think about the long-term effect of always having to fight it. So start with your CRM and tune it up or replace it if it's not working. And then do an 80-20 tech audit. Find out what your team's using. Find out what your team needs. They 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 probably have ideas that would help them do their job better. And then once you ask them, make sure you train them and then make sure they're using it. Use some of that quality uh, assessment tools like you know the, the PDSA cycle, Deming cycle to assess and course correct so that you stay on this because this market's going to just you know go crazy. You're probably already seeing it with you know the AI generated emails that are hitting your inbox. Some of them are just flat out bad. Others are strange and odd because they're scraping the net uh, under your name and pulling up these obscure personalizations that make you think, you know, there's a Zodiac person out there that, that you want to be afraid of. Uh, but the best way to start getting your arms around technology is start with what should be the brain center of your sales operation, which is your CRM. And from there, then layer in what you need to, to help help your sales team get better because there are better tools out there. So those are the, the, the three big sales dots, but I would not be uh, an effective guide or with my salt if I did not give you a bonus one. And the bonus one really starts to wrap all of this stuff together. And the real issue is for all of the expertise that is out there for finance and for leadership and for operations and for sales, most companies fail to look at their sales as an operating system and, and look at it in, in system as in whole. And I'll go back to my, you know, Mr. Deming, every system is perfectly designed to get the results it gets. Uh, some of the stuff, you know, it almost becomes Yogi Berra isms the way he says it, but it it's so direct that if we're not satisfied with the results we're getting, it's probably due to the system that we have in place. Uh, and what's unique is that the issues with manufacturing, because uh, you're really in sales, you're trying to manufacture an outcome. You're, you're trying to navigate and help the client make the right decision. So you, you take a look at something like this, and, and if we're not getting the results, we have to look at the system first and then look at the type of people that are going to operate best inside the system. This one I've seen time and time again. Uh, I just had a company that I was working with, a they hired a sales manager that they shouldn't have hired. Um, it was advised that you not hire them. And this guy's already driving away. He always dro already drove away the number one salesperson. Uh, you put a bad system in place and uh, it's going to win every single time. So how do we untangle this one? Take all of that excellent knowledge that you have. You know, you're you're designing the future of new manufacturing. You've got these great ideas on how you're going much more modular in the way that you're designing your manufacturing centers. Take that same thinking, sales as a system. Map out the key components. What are the customer interaction points? What are the insights? What do you know about your customer's business that they don't know? And start to optimize it as a system. Deming's you know, plan, do, study, act, the iterative process is fabulous for being applied to, to sales because it is a multi-step transformational process. That's why the idea of journey, the idea of manufacturing, the idea of systems lays so well because how were the quality problems of manufacturing solved? They were solved by systematizing it and not just uh, uh, checking everything at the end. Well, wh what has sales been doing for the last hundred years? We're checking everything at the end. What are your numbers? I got to manage to the number. Well, that means you miss all of the things that lead up to that potential outcome. And really the way we should be looking at it is how we help the client make the best decision 
not necessarily just trying to sell something into there. So the four big knots, because you got a bonus because you, you came today. So thank you for coming. But arrive early and help lead the buyer to their best destination. I'm probably going to set the balloons off again. Uh, customize your sales process to capture the unique value of your company and, and your insights and the way that you can help your buyer. Balance your technology, starting with your CRM, so it helps your sales team do their job better. By the way, if you help them do their job better and the process is optimized, the other side bonus you get is that your forecast is going to be more accurate because they're going to be in there and operating it more frequently as opposed to having to you know, use threats and cajoling to get them to do it. And then to sum it all up, look at it as a system and and operate your sales as a system so you can start to uncover where any of those knots are and take them out to optimize your system. And Elizabeth, that's uh, fantastic. So my barrage. Hey, even almost got it in under 30 minutes. You sure did. It's <laughs> wonderful. And we even had balloons to celebrate it. Yeah, I wish I could. It, it seems to be something when you do like that. Zoom now has uh, yeah. has balloons or confetti. <laughs> well, for you attendees, I have changed your settings. So if you would like to unmute yourself, you are able to do so now. And you can personally ask questions of Mike about his process and his presentation. Or I stunned him into silence. <laughs> So Mike, I hate to jump to solutions, but do you have some favorite CRMs? Yeah, there's uh, there's a couple that are are really good. Um, there's uh, for complex sales, there's one called Membrane. Um, that's the one that I use. I, I build my sales processes inside of that. Uh, the guide sales process that I developed is already pre-built inside there, but it, it can then be customized. There's another one called Pipe Drive that is really good for, for complex sales. Uh, I, there's even one in Michigan. Um, there's a, uh, uh, nutshell it's out of Ann Arbor. That's a, that's another small, uh, small company that's doing unique stuff with the way they approach it. Okay. Um, companies, when they started building CRMs, they quickly realized this data would be valuable to the C-suite, which it is. What they failed to do is take user centricity into mind, though, and think that, well, if you make it better for the person using it, that if it actually helps them sell better, then you're going to get better data. And so a lot of the great big ones are not all that user centric. And especially for small to mid market, you have to spend so much money customizing the big names like Salesforce and Dynamics. You could save a ton of money because these smaller ones are much more user friendly and they actually help your sales team sell better, uh, which which should be the goal. That to me, that should be the number one goal for any technology. Is it should help the sales team do their job better. Thank you. Say, so Mike, um, you know, you mentioned the the RFPs. Um, how do you? How does the sales team or sales staff? How do they help the client unknot the complications of the RFP? That's a fabulous question, Ted. So that's all about getting er in early and helping them understand the real problem that they're trying to solve. Uh, most people, if, they, if they're if they honest about how they assess their RFP, most RFPs usually get maybe 40 to 60% of what they ultimately were set out to do. And a lot of, I mean, that's why a lot of uh, building projects have change orders. Yeah, that's why a lot of stuff it's bid up front, and then you end up having a lot of a lot of changes. So when you arrive early, when you're arriving with the insights and the knowledge around your product, and and I, I'm certain that all of the members of of MGA understand the area around their product or solution. And often their clients don't. So you know things that they, and you assume things that they know that they really don't know. So you have to help frame that problem in a way that is going to be best suited for the client's outcome and help them realize that just because 
you know, how are you going to set up the way the decision criteria for your RFP? Are you, are you just going to go with the cheapest? Uh, or are you going to go, you know, whatever their decision criteria is, you have to help them break that down to realize, is that really going to solve the problem? And that can only come by helping to, by building trust and being very buyer centric to show them that like, look, this practice that you've been following does not yield the results that you want. I, I have a client that is working with, uh, they're in the steel industry and these big steel manufacturers, they build these, you know, billion dollar uh, manufacturing facilities. And this, the company has a template that they build every single one of these the same. And the running joke is that everybody knows that then you're going to spend at least 20 to 30% more after you've already spent a billion dollars just trying to fix it to make it work because the company is just like, boom, this is what you get. And there's no you know nuance or discussion up front to be able to help them shape like, well, no, this this is the outcome we need. You know, when when they're that big and they're they're driving the market, they just, you know, they just do what they want. That you did know, I yeah. that or did I go down yeah. too many no, 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 tangential no. trails? <laughs> you know, I, I, I guess the, the, the other thing that's kind of a uh, uh, obstacle is generally the RFP comes out when the client's already halfway up the mountain that you described. And Absolutely, you, you can't come in early because they're right. already down that path. Uh, they're in that right. rabbit hole. Right. And, and sometimes the best strategy is when when the RFP shows up, you just you politely decline. And uh, I've had that. I've used that myself. And then they're like, well, wait, you you, you can't say no. It's like, well, yeah, we can, because we really want the best outcome for you. And the way you have this written, you're going to have a problem with, you know, dot, 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 dot. And you just you start to lay out the problems. And I I have seen them stopped and turned around. I've seen them you know, say, oh, why, well, right, you know, well, we're, we still have to go through with it, but we're going to, we're actually going to go in this direction. Uh, or you just, you, you respond to it, but you put in, you put an alternative approach to say, you know, we wouldn't follow this because of these five things and here's how you should do it. So, but it really starts by looking beyond the product itself. And you have to start thinking about the applications that your client is using your product for and, and how, that you know total delivered solution comes into play you know it could be something as simple as well the way we palletize and ship our our product helps you do you know a b and c whereas you know this other one you have to add all this other value to or have all this other labor to you know to get it prepared or you know we do smaller shipments like like when you really start to break down and look for where those insights and obstacle avoidance ideas are that's when the the value comes and you can equip your sales team with that to really deliver strong customer insights that help improve their business. Right. Mike, before we started this conversation, you had indicated that you have an opportunity that you would like to make available to MGA members. Could you share yes. that with us? Yeah, so uh, I uh, value what MGA is doing and, and I'm rooting for uh, the manufacturing sector in Michigan. So I, if MGA members would like 30 minutes of free consulting, I will be happy to walk them through any part of this that they have questions or any other questions that they have uh, about sales and uh, give them 30 minutes at no charge. All they have to do is email me. Uh, they could even text me if they wanted. That's my direct mobile up there. And just put, you know, MGA plus not, MGA plus not. Uh, and I'd be happy to schedule time with them and uh, have that conversation. That's wonderful. Thank you. It's incredibly generous. And uh, we have a few more minutes. And so uh, as a reminder, you are able to unmute yourself if you would like to ask a question personally. Uh, and we will hang around for another until 945. Uh, so if you'd like to stay and chat with us, we're certainly able to do so. Since looks like, sorry, I thought we had some person unmuting. You know, Mike, I, I do have another kind of question. Thank you, Ted. Um, mm -hmm. the, the notion here of like, you know, you talk about Dr. Deming. One of his points uh, was establishing consistency and constancy of purpose. 
How do you diplomatically get your client to do that with you as a salesperson? That's a great question. So if you think about how the traditional relationship is, it's it's kind of it's almost adversarial. What what I advocate for when I set up the the approaches is I want it to be more instead of like this, I want it to be more like this. And and I want it to be more navigational so that my whole approach, that the your whole approach as a new sales team is that you're gonna approach with insights and value and the customer's best outcome in mind. So it's it's kind of a flip. It used to be like, hey, we got to sell, you know, got to sell, 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 you know, at, at whatever it takes, we're going to get this deal over the edge. And that doesn't necessarily lead to client value. That's part of what has driven the clients away because that's very selfish on my part. But if if I'm direct with you and we're having conversations that are related to your problems or your challenges, and there has to be a level of trust built before I can have even that conversation. Cause you don't want me to sit down and go, look, boy, Ted, you got all these problems. Uh, that constancy of purpose means I'm looking out for you. My, your, your business is my first priority. And so if I can't help you as the guide, as, as the enlightened salesperson, my first step should be, you know what, Ted, we, we understand, we agree that this is the problem you're trying to solve. Elizabeth is the best one to do that. Not me. Um, I can help you with these five things, but this, this thing that you need over here, which is really what it looks like you have to do first, you know, I, it's not in my best interest to suit you because I'm, or I can't suit you. So you really should talk to these other companies. That's the big change. The, the to me, the big change is that it's it's that buyer centricity, so that I'm looking out for you and my your your well being is my responsibility, and I I just happen to have the products and services that can help move you along. So that's where the system starts to change, and that's where the buyer centricity comes back. And you know, the, the reason we have to do it is because of that two sided problem up front. You know, they don't want to work with us, but they need to work with us. <laughs> So that means we have to change the dynamic of how we're engaging so that they want to work with us. Mike, how do you train and coach sales staff for that mentality and for that that shift in mindset? Uh, I start with helping align the sales process in a way that it can be put into the system. So this is where it goes. It goes very deming. So we start by fixing the sales process so that it is much more customer centric. And and that it actually helps the sales team. And then using, you know, the, the Pareto principle, 80-20, we put in that 20% that is the most impactful to the yielding success for both the client and the company. And those are the things, those are the maps or the playbooks that get put in each part of the process. Then I'll coach sales managers and the sales team on this new process. And then since it's in there, they're using it every day, the adoption comes faster. So then we start to break down, what does the first conversation look like? What are the questions you need to ask to really understand what they're doing? You know, How do you get to the transfer of trust? And once you have that transfer of trust, how do you then start talking to them about the implications? And, you know, there's, there's always three, there's always three strands to the knot. You know, there's going to be the technical part, which is pretty easy, right? I mean, all of all of the companies here, all the MGA members, they're going to know their technical aspects, you know, cold. There's going to be a financial reason, which, by the way, 95% of the time, that's not the reason why you, you didn't get the business. It wasn't price. Uh, that's the reason they tell us, but that's not the real reason. And then the third strand of the knot is the emotional political. And that's the part that most people miss. You know, what does, to, to Ted's standpoint, that constancy or Ted's question, that constancy of purpose, you know, uh, what does this project do to Ted's emotional well-being? Is he taking it home? Is he terrified? Is it, is it, or is it his 10th one? He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, you know, get, get it over with for me. Those are the three parts that we have to take into account. So you start walking that and you build that into each part of the sales process. So then you train to the sales process. So they remember it much more readily because it's not like we have a seminar and then they go away. It's like, no, it's this is getting into your daily operation and it's helping you 
sell better. Fantastic. Does that, does that I, I help? Learned, it really does. I learned a lot in this in this conversation. I'm really grateful for you to spend some time with us. Uh, to you as MGA members and, and uh, participants, thank you so much for joining us. We'll be around for a few more minutes if you want to unmute. Otherwise, thank you so very much for joining us and we'll see you at the next event. Mike, thank you. Yeah, yeah thank you, everybody.